Okay. Woo. Where we go. Greetings and salutations, my friend. I am Jeremy Tank. You are in the Manifest Design Experience, and we are talking about your brand. We are talking about the thing that you are building. You are talking about, oh boy, the things that excite you, that get you going, that make life worthwhile, right? And that's creating something in the world, really. Uh, that could be your personal brand and the way that you influence other people. That can be your business. That could be uh, the corporation you work for and your role in that corporation. Doing something, hopefully, that's aligned with your intents, your values, and building something worthwhile in the world. Today, we're going to cover the five elements of brand influence, which are huge. And I've touched on some of these elements in past videos, so hopefully this is not new material. And it, definitely when you look at some of the uh, exercises, the worksheets and the guides and the directions, you'll start to see how a lot of this stuff just melds right together. The idea of brand influence uh, is the idea that when you interact with anything around you, it is influencing how you perceive it how you interact with it, how you react to it, and therefore either how you keep going back to it or you, you go, okay, I hate that, and I walk away. And there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of psychology that goes into that. There's a lot of design that goes into that. And there's a lot of emotional recognition that is ignored, but is a huge part of that. Um, so before I jump into that today, I just wanted to say uh, I am now accepting new clients. I am, I've got uh, a cleared slate, so I'm working with new clients right now. Uh, we are utilizing this process, the manifest design process, the branding process for either you, your new business, your old business that needs a, a refresh, uh, even small businesses, corporations, everything like that. This is the same process that major companies are reusing really, um, to do like five and ten million dollar campaigns because what they get that a lot of the smaller businesses and smaller brands sort of skip over is hey let's create this vision let's create the idea let's create the big picture of what this stuff is supposed to be and then when we start actually spending these millions and millions of dollars on it they are going towards goals that we have identified they are going towards um, speaking to the right people whom we have identified and everything really the foundation has been laid to progress further and further What I see is a lot of business people um, And if you're in this group, then you might be a an alternative medicine provider. You might be a coach. You might be a consultant uh, You just might be out helping people um Gosh, you're doing anything, really. The coaching business is so wide open right now. I know there are some acupuncturists in here, some naturopaths in here. I thank you guys for hanging in because a lot of this stuff you kind of go, okay, well, I don't really need that. But the problem is, I just got to get this out of the way first. The problem is, if you don't think of that big picture first, then what you are doing is throwing away money. And I, I oh, there's part of me that just hates saying that, throwing away money. Um, but it's true. If you don't have that vision for what you're building, how you're building it, everything growing, then you are not implementing the systems in the right order, in the right impact to get you where you need to go in the easiest, smoothest, most efficient way. That is called alignment. That is called not forcing it, not hustling, but creating alignment so that there is a flow between what you have and where you want to go. And a lot of what I'm doing right now with this process, with the manifest design, with, with all of this stuff, is called brand strategy. That is the base level of what it's called, brand strategy. Now, big corporations are, um, you know, I, I worked with a guy who's in the pot industry here in Washington that just did this entire process with an agency in London because that's who he was told to go to. It was a huge agency in London. And he spent somewhere between thirty-five and $55,000 to get the same sort of thing that you can see in all of these exercises and the same sort of thing that you get with me, only with me, you get it more customized to you. Um, he spent I, I, $35,000 was what it was right out the door. I think by the time he was done, it was closer to $55,000 to basically say, you know, here's 
the position we think you can take. This is what they told him. Here's the position we think you can take. Here's the archetype we think you should use. Here's how that might look when you are speaking to your audience. Here's all the different ways that shows up in the stories that you tell and how you present your brand uh, out into the audience. And from there, he was able to spend close to half a million dollars on marketing, on uh, logos, on designers, on advertisements, on all sorts of things, on packaging that were necessary and ultimately he could have he's going to have to do those anyway but what happened is now all of them have this thread tying through them so they all feel common they all feel similar they all feel like they're on the same track and a lot of times what i hear when i'm talking with people who have not used this process who have not used brand strategy who have not worked with a strategist to think through some of this big picture and foundational stuff is that they spoke with you know, a marketing team and a website designer and a logo designer and gosh, who else? SEO, um, an ad agency, probably package designers and all these different people have their own ideas and their own processes to pull out what's important for their needs. And one of the challenges we know is that what you see in your head when you are looking at something doesn't always translate the same into somebody else's head when they hear it and they see it because they're going to view the solutions through their lens. So part of what this process is doing is creating a big picture that you can share with all of these team members and hopefully with your creative director, hopefully, you know, if you're the creative director for your brand, your personal brand, whatever that is, um, you know, you're, you're building this vision so that you can share it with everybody else and keep them on task, keep them on brand, keep them on budget, keep them on, on everything. Because when you have that big picture, it's easier to break it down into its individual parts and see how they each support one another. So those, the five, the five basic parts that we're going to talk about today are the five ooh, really fundamental aspects of brand building and brand influence. Influence meaning there's a, a book by, um, Robert, I think it's Cialdini, uh, called uh, Marketing Influence. And in this book, he, he breaks down some of the ways that influence is happening. And by influence, what I mean is psychological influence. So brands, businesses, um, leaders utilizing psychological tricks to get someone to align with their perspective and start down the path to what they want to happen. Now, this is in very extreme contrast to the idea of marketing manipulation, which is really push, right? If it's, I think of the old, old school like car salesman who was just really pushy, 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 really trying to get you to buy, you know, do this. Um, it's got tires. It's got an engine. You know, just buy the car. Just buy it and get it off the lot. This is much more um, in align with, look, I want to support you this is influence i want to support you and your goals and where you are going with your life your business everything like that and the way that i know how to support that is with my tools my product my service and this is what that looks like if you want this for you then hire me if that sounds familiar because that is the tactic i take when i'm speaking with you about manifest design, about the branding process, about moving forward and building the things that you want to build in life. It is very much an alignment process of, I provide this service. If and when you are in need of that, before you take the next steps, then work with me. Um, so, my board today says the five elements of brand influence because we're using psychology, we're using the way that the brain works, the mind works in a way that influences how people see your brand, your product, your service, your person, right? If you're, if you're an internet famous kind of person, your person is your brand. So you, if you're a small business, um, then likeliness is that you are your brand. So people see you and the services you provide as a reflection of your brand. Now, when I'm talking about brand, what that really is, is not a logo. It's not advertising. It's not even your business. The brand is really this sort of internal feeling that your customers have towards what you offer and how you oh, resonate, talk, emote, share, communicate back and forth with one another. There's sort of a relationship there because when you are building a brand, a brand is a piece of um, mental real estate. 
So when somebody says, ah, I need, you know, here's what I hope is that when you say, I need a brand guy, I need a creative brand guy who just gets it and I need to ask him a bunch of questions, you automatically think Jeremy Tank. That's how I think of this stuff. When you have a brand, then people automatically start to associate whatever that brand is with you. Uh, Nike would be like sports. Nike's hard, right? Let's think about that. Nike isn't shoes. Nike isn't shirts. Nike isn't hats. Nike isn't sports drinks. Um, Nike is events. Nike is uh, social change. Nike is all of these different things that are aspects of who they are. And when we think it's like Nike is sports, Nike Nike is more than sports. Nike is just, just do it. Like their tagline for life becomes their brand. That's, that's huge. Uh, Starbucks used to be like the, the coffee shop of community. And now it's sort of just the coffee shop, coffee shop of every corner. And they're still surviving the pandemic. Now they're transitioning to the stop and go coffee shops. So brands, are an idea of how people relate with you and to you. And through the idea of influence in psychology, you remove the idea of your product, your service from your specific product or service from the idea of brand to your customer so that you or the bigger corporation or the bigger feeling or the solutions that you provide are the, the, the fulcrum, right? It's, it's this lever going back and forth. The solutions you provide are just one little aspect of everything. Your brand, becomes greater because you can rise above whatever product or service you can evolve products and services in general over time get more competitors end up becoming more of a commodity and at that point a commodity service is racing to the bottom in price because if there's no difference between you and somebody else offering your services a customer will always go to the cheapest and that's a race to the bottom but when you build your brand, you are building an emotional connection in their mind, in their neurobiology. You are building, hopefully, an emotional connection in their, their senses and their feelings that make them want to work with you in whatever it is you're doing. And that, that right there is beyond any product or service. That can expand to huge levels. <sighs> I'm thinking of oatmeal for some reason and, and like Quaker, how Quaker has so many different varieties of oatmeal, but they could also make oatmeal cookies and it makes perfect sense to me, right? What else, what else might involve that? Breads, I could see Quaker bread, I could see Quaker oats, I could see Quaker uh, granola, right? The idea of Quaker, the brand of Quaker, that guy with the, the was it a tricorn hat or an old school hat um, on those rounded oatmeal tins, like suddenly that idea branches out all over the place. We, we uh, in advertising, we used to say that that brand has legs because you can apply it in so many different places. And that is the point of a brand. That is the point of brand strategy. That is the point of this broad level thinking. These five aspects of brand influence are the key to getting that broad level thinking so you can establish a really strong foundation. You know, um, down in Seattle, uh, they're, they're tearing down a bunch of buildings. COVID has been a fantastic opportunity for them to rip up a lot of downtown Seattle, rip out buildings and start building brand new buildings. You know, it's, it's really interesting to watch because when they are ripping out these old buildings, you know, they're usually surface street level or just a little bit below, um, depending on where the buildings are. And then they end up digging way, way down. They end up digging these huge huge, like three, four, five stories down into the ground to put up these new buildings because they are heavier. They require a deeper foundation, a more solid foundation so that they can go higher and suit more people. Well, your brand is the same way. When we establish this foundation and the five elements of influence are part of this foundation, when we establish the foundation, then your brand actually has more capability to move beyond you, to move beyond your employees, your product, your service. Um, it can scale right? And that is part of what we want for you is the ability to scale. I read an article this week that was about, um, that was about the great resignation happening, uh, across the world actually right now. And the, 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 the writer of this article was saying, you know, how they speculated when this trend started, that people were moving away from employers that they felt were crappy, where they felt stuck internally, where they didn't feel like there was a career trajectory. And this writer felt that they were not 
moving on to other businesses, but actually creating their own business, but actually starting something new. And I love this idea that that people are moving away from like the old paradigm to actually start something, some ground roots um, movements in in small business and services that you understand and know. And this is, you know, going on two two and a half years ago, I foresaw this, and I actually have it on my website as part of my mission to help these people who are starting their own business, who are growing, and need to create the right structure to move into as they grow and the economy gets back on track and they are supercharged for the next leap in what happens. So I hope you guys, you know, if, you, if, if you're following that path, if you're part of the Great Resignation, hopefully you're in here and you're listening to these videos and realizing how a little bit of brand strategy, a little bit of, of big picture thinking really starts to improve things. So, five elements of brand influence of personal brands, small business brands, it could be any business brand, and corporate brands. Corporate brands meaning, you know, either the products, the services, or the, or the corporations themselves. Because honestly, um, Facebook turning to Meta was a branding move. Facebook turning to Meta was a, a corporate move to get rid of the stigma associated with the brand of Facebook and move into a place that is more open and accepting and new. And that's an interesting experiment at a huge corporate global corporation level. So uh, the first element of brand influence, well, what is the first element, right? Let's think about that, just you and me for a moment. Let's think about it. Like, what is the most important thing? And that's how I'm going to frame this, because every one of these elements builds on the elements before it. Every one of these elements requires an understanding and knowledge of the element before it for influence to be successful. So what do you think is the first huge element of influence for the brand, for your brand? If you said vision, you would be right. Because vision is what's happening in the future. It's the future you want to see. It's your imagination taking over. It's actually the act of creation, taking steps to build something that you see in your head. And it's the end results of that. There's, there's <laughs> I've been reading um, several, uh, gosh, the pandemic has been a great opportunity for corporate, uh, corporate um, marketers to rewrite mission statements, to rewrite vision statements, and they are getting it wrong. A lot of them are getting it wrong because they write a vision as if it is the thing that they do every single day. And in terms of vision and mission, the vision is the outcome that you see. And that makes sense when we think about the vision, like what is it we're seeing? What is it we're imagining? What is it we're trying to create? That makes total sense that it's out there, right? But vision is anchored in, there we go, purpose. Vision is anchored in purpose. I see this world because something is missing. I want to bring this to it so that I can get to this vision that I have. And the purpose is your why, right? This is a brand strategy statement in total. Brand strategy is saying, look, I do this thing because I want people to feel this way when working with me because that will create the transformation that I seek in the world and create my vision. Now, what happens between those two is the breakdown, the systems that happen um, that turn into mission. Every day, my mission in my brand and my company and my corporation and my, you know, if you're a product manager, the products that I do, if you are a software engineer, it's, you know, every day I'm coding because my mission is to create software. If you're an acupuncturist, every single day you are helping people because your mission is to alleviate their pain, their suffering, their the things that they feel that aren't right to them. If you're a naturopath, your, your mission is to help people heal because your purpose is healing people for a healthy world, right? So that people feel better when they leave, when you create and the, the vision total of that happening. If you help everybody is your vision is you've helped the world. Things are easier. People are more healthy. If you're a fitness coach, your mission is to every day go out and help people become more fit, right? And why do you do that? Why becomes your purpose? You do that because you see a need, because you feel 
attached to them because you want to see a world where everybody is fit, where everybody uh, is healthy and living to their best ability. Now, what happens because of that vision, because of that purpose, is alignment. Either somebody believes what you are saying and wants to join you in your purpose and your vision, or they don't. And this is really a hiring thing. This is internal culture as well as external culture. If somebody wants to work with you and get hired by you to help build your vision, that's an employee. If someone wants to work with you because they believe in your vision and they want to improve themselves, that's a customer. That's how alignment works with vision. And of course, the more that you build, you get community. So your vision is the builder of community because internally, the people who want to help build your vision, they have alignment with you, with your values, how you are doing things. Um, they become your internal your internal community. The people who um, are out in the world and, and love your services and are sharing it with others and telling them uh, what you do and how amazing it is and transformative it is, that becomes your external community, your fans, your tribe, right? It's all about community. And the thing is that we are hardwired up here for this vision, for community, for alignment, for purpose. We are hardwired as part of that tribe mentality. We are hardwired as part of community for survival. This is um, the, it's not caveman instinct. It's like the next level up. It's uh, not the limbic brain, but like the midbrain moving into the forebrain. The forebrain is that area up here that really is about logic. It's about things uh, making sense. It's very rational and plotting and planning. And back here is that limbic brain. It's kind of deep inside there. And that limbic brain is the caveman brain, the lizard brain that's all about survival, self, reproduction, food, right? It's the base instincts. And a lot of times in life, we're moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between these regions of our brain, between these regions of our consciousness, our mental state, as we figure out, you know, how do we survive? And there's a point eh, somewhere towards the front here that's like, look, community helps. And the way that we figure out who our community is, is by what they are trying to do. You know, what is the vision that they have? And why do they have that vision? Um, the purpose. And then do I want to be part of that vision? Sure I do, because it means greater survival to me, right? And then community. And this applies even on a uh, corporate level, even on a, um, a product level that people don't actually think about because Apple is a huge example. And in his book, This Is Marketing, Seth Godin actually used Apple as an example of this to say, look, Apple has this vision of really influencing and bringing technology to everybody equally all, all across the board. And as part of their why, you know, they started with creatives, they've moved now into fashion, they've moved now into making it easy for everybody to partake of their their technology for health, for fitness, for creativity, for reaching the internet, um, soon to be for virtual reality if Apple Glasses comes out. And then the decision, is it worth it? Is this something for me? And millions of people around the world will say, yeah, I, I believe in this. You know, they, they, they're using their products to bring their purpose. Their purpose is bringing technology to the people that's easy to use so they can build this vision of technology being everywhere and easily in, used. So then they are building their community. And the thing behind Apple is that they're using now with the Apple Watch, uh, soon with Apple Glasses, certainly with the more fashion statements of phones, they are using technology as a, as a, hmm, it's almost like a gold medal. Hey, look at me, I've got the new iPhone. That's how it feels like. I've got the new watch, check it out. It's a status symbol. And that goes to our inner, like egotistic, um, I'm not using that in a bad way. I'm using it in the way that's like, look, I, this is the part of me that caveman sense that says, look, I need to protect myself. I need to make sure I'm good. By showcasing something of high status, I am showing my alignment. I am showing part of my purpose. I am showing part of the vision that I believe in to the outside world so that I can attract others who believe the same thing, who enjoy the same products, and that creates community. And that, it's why vision is the first of the brand elements of influence because that's what creates all this movement, this concept. It's really defining um, what needs to change in the world and why and how you are going to create that vision. And then every single day is the mission to do it. The second element in the brand, uh, second element in, in brand influence is story. Story. 
once you understand the vision that you are creating in the world, once you understand whew, what that looks like, right? You start to get a scope. I can see it in my head. Um, you start to get a scope of, okay, well, here is the future that I want. And here is where I am now. Let's think about what I want again, because now is hard, right? Now is always hard. That's one of those things that now is rough. We get lost in now. We get lost in what can go wrong, what has gone wrong up until this point. I'm supposed to be here now, and then there's the future. And then if we think of what we want in the future, I always forget the video, which way is left, left or right. Um, when we think of what we want in the future, our consciousness actually takes where we are now and extrapolates along the timeline into that future and it brings up resistance of all the things that can go wrong and that's not a bug that's a feature of the mind and consciousness figuring out what can what can go figuring out what can go wrong is part of our fight or flight training from our emergency trauma systems into our brain teaching it how to look for things that can go wrong. And what does that look like? That looks like what's the conflicts that are going to come up, right? What, what are the people are going to try to stop me and intern? And that's really a lot of that's looking forward. So a lot of that is internal. It's what, who do I think is going to stop me? Who do I think, how do I think this is going to happen? So many assumptions happen in story. But if we look back at that vision and then we look forward, then we have to start making some assumptions first. We have to start with an assumption of, of anything that can go wrong so that we can proactively start working with those ideas. The other is risk. Risk. When we start looking to the future, what do I have to risk? What is the payoff of that? How do I reach that future that I want? Between conflict and risk, we actually reach a point of plot. We start to tell a story to ourselves, about ourselves, about our brand, about the way that we believe our brand is built, about the way that our brand is perceived, about the way that we interact with others, that others see us. And 80% of the time, that story, that plot is based in that resistance of thought between the current now and the future that we want. It's not based on realistic factors. It's not based on anything other than what we currently know. And then we project into the future. Now, here's the good news. None of that really is real. <laughs> That's all our imagination. But it gives us a great opportunity to start writing down those concerns and addressing them. Uh, start writing down the conflicts, start writing down the risk assessment in our heads, start writing down the plot that we think is going to happen. And then we can start rewriting the plot. This is why it's super important to have that vision first, to have the knowledge about, you know, the, your purpose, why you're actually doing the thing. Is it big enough to actually excite you into moving forward, whatever that means to you? Because you have to craft this story. And this story is the story that will align people. This is the story that will pull your community together. If it's powerful to you and it's powerful to them, it includes them. It includes everything that you want to be able to reach that end goal. The first step is to kind of go through this process and empty your brain of all the resistance. Write it all down. All the conflict, all of the risks, um, the, the plot that you hear in your head. There's an interesting uh, thing I learned in hypnotherapy where, and, and there's a lot of NLP in this too, where, you know, the first seven years that we're born, we are just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. We're absorbing culture and language and the physics of our body, the physics of the world around us, how we actually move and manipulate ourselves in this world. So that by about seven or eight, um, kids have a pretty good standing of who they are and their personality starts to develop based on all these thoughts and beliefs. Well, what happens is those thoughts and beliefs start telling them stories in their head about the way that the world is based on what they've experienced up till then. And those stories continue throughout the rest of our lives. Those stories are what drives us or ooh, creates fear inside. And that's why this, this step in particular, this part of influence is super important is to write down those stories and then change them. Because when we change them, 
then we actually gain control over the consciousness that is running amok telling a bad story. That resistance that I described between um, what is and what can be for that future, that resistance is all those bad stories popping up telling you you can't. Uh, and it, it, it shakes our confidence. It elevates fear. It triggers a trauma response, either fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Um, we're up to four Fs now. There's all these responses that go on, and these are all balanced in your physiology, in the, in the um, emotions that you feel, and the way that your brain turns on or turns off. And certainly all of the um, neurotransmitters, chemicals, electrical signals that go through your body when you tell yourself a negative story and you note the resistance and you hold on to the resistance as the story, oh boy, some negative processing happens in the body. And when you rewrite that, and mindfulness helps with this, mindfulness, having a vision and breathing, meditating, taking a moment, for those of you who are in the acupuncture, I'll go ahead and say qigong, tai chi, um, <clears throat> yoga even, these types of movement, these types of breathing exercises actually allow the brain and the senses to regain a point of perspective. They promote um, a return of balance and logic to the, the prefrontal cortex up here um, and allow us to kind of rewrite that story on the go. So the story is the second of, of the influence elements because when you share a story, it actually creates a picture in somebody else's head. And when you write this story in a powerful way, really sharing your vision and sharing what's going on, then it creates scope. It creates a frame of, of, of what the benefits and the features and, and why people need to make the choices in their life to go with you for your brand, your products, your services, your, your, who you are, right? And this can actually be taken a couple different ways. And there's an individual level, certainly, and there is a uh, business or a corporation kind of level. And all of this works the same way because when our minds see the structure of vision and story and characters and everything else, then it all falls in line at greater levels. It follows the same sort of structure um, regardless of the brand. Uh, yeah. So I just gave you a hint to the third one. But our third, our third brand influence element is characters characters you cannot have a story without characters the story you're deriving is the difference really between what you notice in the world this is your vision between what you notice in the world now and what you want it to be in the future this therefore creates a spectrum of contrast what is what can be um, and then you're just going to move along that story that that spectrum that is the story that spectrum because you see what needs to happen to create the change either in your customers or in their world to be able to create that vision of the outcome. That's your story that is so powerful, but you can't tell a story without characters. Even if they are not animated, even if they are um, static, even if it's a book or a plant or you know uh, anything, a, a drum, it doesn't matter. It becomes a character. And one of the, one of the things we've talked about with characters is archetypes. Here we go, archetypes. You don't have to be really dimensional, three-dimensional, have all these different things going on in your character's life when you are telling this story because that gets too complicated in order to tell a brand story. Archetypes are beautiful because they are pulled from the collective consciousness. All of us have this sort of unconscious, uh, socially derived idea of types of characters and they hold to their, their, their archetype. This would be like the hero, the hermit, the guide, the wizard, um, the, the maverick, the warrior, right? These are ideas that we can go, okay, yeah, I kind of understand what that might be. And as long as you can understand what that might be, then you have characters that are archetypes. And you can start to place those characters into the story at different places. And the way you know where to place them is because you start to identify their needs and their wants in terms of your story and the vision that you have for the future. For example, um, if, you, if you have a company that is all about tires, thinking of someone in particular here, if you have a company that's all about tires, then your story is really about 
you know, making sure everybody has safe tires on the road, making sure that your customers don't have to worry about tires, don't have to worry about tread, don't have to worry about um, moisture on the roads or snow on the roads or anything else on the roads. And so you might think of, of you know, you're trying to prevent accidents. Therefore, the conflict in the story might be an accident that happens to prove the necessity for the tire that is a grade above, right? So your, your character needs to have safety and they want to have uh, maybe a good price. Now, what does that sound like in terms of an archetype? Well, if that were a wizard archetype, that doesn't fit for that character because a wizard archetype is one who can walk into a situation and sort of make things happen. This could be a hero archetype, certainly, because they're going through this challenge, but that means that as a hero archetype, they kind of follow the hero's journey very precisely, and they have to have a couple different challenges against them that push them to finally make the change, which means they might have an accident in terms of your story as you tell it in order to create the change. This might just be the archetype of the everyman. Every man wants to feel safe. Every man, um, and we can change that for political correctness of everybody. It's just the generic mankind sort of man. Um, every, everybody wants to drive safely. Everybody wants to create a journey in their car from one place to another and arrive at the destination safe. So that, you know, the every man, the every person could be the archetype that is perfect for your tire business. And what this all means is that we are showing, again, alignment versus conflict. If, if uh, the point of archetypes is that because we all recognize the universality of an archetype, when we see ourselves in that archetype through that story, we create alignment. We create alignment in our heads. We create alignment with our knowledge of solutions. We create alignment with the neurobiology of community and knowing people then who can solve our problem if we have that problem, if we identify ourselves with that problem and we identify what the solution is if we don't use this solution, which is part of the conflict, which is part of the um, challenge that is expressed in the story. The other one is conflict. If people do not see themselves in the story, if people do not resonate with the alignment, if people do not step into that, then your brand is out of alignment with that audience. And what that can create is uh, two things, neutrality, which is nothingness, or conflict. So it, it radically opposes something that they believe, something that they inhabit, something that they hold within themselves about your brand, your service, something like that. And what you wanna do is listen to those people and talk with those people to find out what is it that doesn't seem um, in alignment if you really want to serve them, if you are, if they are not part of your audience, then move with alignment because alignment will get people coming to you that want to work with you, that want your services, that understand based on the story that you tell and based on your vision that, you know, what you are doing is valuable and they uh, can be helped. So hopefully you guys are hearing this and, and, and it's making some sense to you, right? First, we have a vision of vision, which is the idea. And then we take that vision and we say, okay, well, what is the current reality? That is our story that we start to tell, that current reality versus the future reality. And looking at that timeline, like, what does that look like? Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, the lady who's a teacher who quit the teaching job and is now opening a, a micro school. I, I love this story because this is what I've been waiting for since the pandemic started. Um, I love the idea of teachers saying, look, I don't want to deal with the school and the school board and everything going on. I'm, I'm opening up my own um, small school. <laughs> um, I grew up in a charter school in Arizona. I, my junior and senior year of high school was a very specialized charter school. A charter school is a school that has a charter or a, a purpose, a meaning. They exist only to help their students achieve that purpose. And my school was a performing and visual arts school. So I see this trend now, and it is a trend, it is growing, of teachers saying, you know, I don't want to work for the district or the school um, because I don't agree with the values, I don't agree with the story that they are telling, I don't agree with the reality that they are presenting because their vision is not aligned with me, and I will open up my own school and meet or exceed the standards in the state of the country for all of these tests, and I will be helping students of a variety of ages. 
got a little sidetracked there. I just, I get excited about that idea. And since I, I, again, I forget your name, but I, you know, it's really great talking to you because I love that idea. But you hear the story that I'm sharing. I'm, I'm sort of reflecting what we talked about in terms of story in that, look, there are times that breaking away and starting a business is part of our story. And it's part of the vision of, of raising a future generation in this case that is more capable, more hmm, interactive, more respective of the environment and the world around us than previous generations that were very much more, um, you know, millennials, certainly Gen X a little bit, Gen Z quite a bit, um, were forced along a timeline, forced into a way of being and into college because they were told the world would be a certain way, but there is no way that we can actually guarantee the world in the future to be a certain way, except for unless when we promise it, it would be worse. And I'd rather not hold to that. So, um, the point of that entire thing is that, you know, when we start to have these discussions, when you're working with me, at least, um, it's really easy to start to see this story playing out. It's really start to see when we put it in terms of the vision and in terms of the students, in this case, um, the students become the hero of the story. The students, you know, it's, it's nice to think that we look at this story and we look at the characters and we think, oh, well, I'm the hero creating uh, the school. But really, you are, uh, you, you're the guide. You're, you're the wizard starting something to, <laughs> you're Dumbledore starting the school for all the little wizards, all the little Harry Potters, all the heroes popping up. Um, and that's the idea, is that when you tell these stories, you know, you give room for your customers to come in because that vision of the future that you're building is not about you, it's about the world. And to influence the world, we have to have all of these characters. Okay, so the fourth element in brand influence is systems. I spent a long time um, on another video talking about systems and processes and the way that the brain works and the way that we are entrained within systems to build greater systems and memory and structures um, and um, compounds. <laughs> compounds? Okay, that's the word that came out. But the, the next step is systems because everything you need in a business needs to happen on a system. A system allows the brain your brain, my brain, every brain, to recognize consistency, and consistency builds neural connections. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Systems allow that story that you tell to be presented in a myriad of ways in over and over and over and over again. And because it is the same story told over and over and over again, your audience Here's it once, twice, three times, a dozen times, a hundred times, and it's always the same. So therefore, all of the neurons that are tied into that emotional response, that are tied into that um, needs response, wants response, storytelling response, become entangled in this beautiful neural network that is tied to your brand. So systems create repetition and uh, compatibility, really because the repetition and, and everything uh, allows it to, to play out and build those neural networks. So we have three types of systems here that we need to think about. I'll try to put this in the right thing here. Um, so the first is broad. Broad systems include the idea of like a logo or brand system. And this is a system because it needs to be consistent where people see it. It needs to be consistent in, uh, lo in ooh, color, shape, form, and it needs to have enough consistency that people can identify a logo when they see it. Um, brand systems are colors, uh, voice, the way that, that uh, the brand's voice shares things about itself. That'd be like a personality, the identity behind it, um, the types of pictures, the types of patterns that are shared. These are the sort of things that are part of the brand identity system that allows it, again, consistency builds those neural networks. Um, marketing 
has multiple systems underneath it, lead generation, inbound marketing, outbound marketing, uh, email marketing, all of these things are part of systems and the repetition, the consistency of those allows us to evaluate every single piece of the system. And there's, there's, I'm just, this is broad, right? I'm very, very broad right now. Um, and the more you dig into each of those, um, they're littler systems. And that's actually the next one is supportive systems. Supportive systems are those processes within a system that need to happen to make the big system happen. Uh, this might be uh, if you're in a company that does annual reviews or have ever been in a company that does annual reviews, your boss does like 15 reviews for you and your uh, other the, your other coworkers, and then that boss gets hand takes those reviews and hands them up and then he gets reviewed or she gets reviewed and then that boss above them she gets reviewed and hands everything up until everything gets filed away and from the top down this whole pyramid of reviews has happened these are all supportive systems and there is a system to reviews for most companies that i have talked with because you have to implement uh, a system so that they are done consistent consistently from year to year and person to person and then that supports the broad system and the final one is the specific system. And that is something that that talks about, hmm, I think that is a very specific use, a very specific system to accomplish a very specific task. Uh, and that might be, uh, for example, uh, gosh, I'm stuck on this annual review idea. Uh, on an annual review, you want to make sure the name goes, your name goes on, the employee name goes on, and then whatever ratings and feedback go on. And those are specific within the system of the reviews within the, uh, okay, those are specific systems, your tasks to do in the part of the supportive system of reviews import of the, the broad system of HR employee management. Oof. Let's try some let's try an area that I'm a little more familiar with marketing. Okay. A broad marketing system might be outbound marketing. Outbound marketing is where you are reaching out to somebody in some way to get their interest. So a broad outbound system might sound like might look like just um, a series of emails or a series of messages going out on Facebook or LinkedIn and just connecting with people saying, you know, I'd like to get to know you better. A supportive system might be three or four emails that go into that broader system that first talk about who you are and what you do. Second, ask the person to communicate with you and tell them more about them and their world and what they need. Like you're learning about their character, trying to define and find out if they are part of the archetype that fits into your story. Are they somebody who might align with your story? Will they fit easily into the needs, wants categories in the character? that you have created and you want to share the story with this person. This is part of the series. And then the specific system might be taking the things that they give you about themselves. This is, this involves real listening, real curiosity, learning about them so that the more that you speak with them as part of this broad system, the more you can use their specific points about their life, about their needs, about, uh, their family, their car, their pets. Um, it's very specific and you want to be very specific in order to, to build a real relationship because that is what creates the bond in branding is building that real relationship, finding things that go back and forth that are mutual. It's alignment. So broad, supportive and specific, all three systems, all three levels of systems can really be applied across the board in all the different things that you are doing. And you have to sort of think that way in business in terms of the, the broad systems you have to put in and then all of the, all of the little things that support it. And then all of the tiny things that make it very specific, um, when you start to do things and really it just adds up one onto the other, because all of these systems support get like they, they build a relationship with the characters in your story and you are sharing the story and you are sharing your vision. And all of this builds in emotional resonance. And that is sharing the why, you know, see uh, Simon Sinek's why, start with why, why does this exist? Well, all of this builds the why, builds community, builds alignment so that you get what you want. You get to build your brand and build towards that future. And by having people who are aligned with it, you are on track. 
So the last one here, the last element of brand influence is feedback. And I know this sounds kind of weird because I've, I've shared this before with people. I'm like, no, the last element's feedback. Once you know your vision, once you understand that story and all the plots and all the points of resistance and you have written in that, you know, the points of resistance don't matter. Here's how we're going to overcome that. Here's our next challenge. Here's the things that can come up. You, you've basically created um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey as part of the story to create this vision of the future, right? It's awesome. And you start populating it with the characters, support characters, main characters, antagonist, protagonist, right? All the things that could just stop you, all the different ways that you are telling this story. And at the end you say, hey, does that interest you? Is that something you might be interested in? Are your needs met? Did I hit everything for you? Does everything feel right? Is that something you would be interested in joining? And by the way, what else? What else would get you excited? What else am I missing? What else did I forget? What else do you need in life? What else can I do to help you on this path from, well, in my sense, from wherever you are right now to the brand you want to build? What can I do to help you on that journey? Are your needs met with the things in this group? Are your needs met with the tools I have provided you? Are your needs met with the 30 different exercises with uh, probably a dozen videos now? Are your needs met? Are you building your brand that way you intend? Are you focused? Are you building systems in to make sure that you are continuing on that path effortlessly? That's what systems help with. And last, will you tell others? Ooh, there's a tricky one. A lot of us forget that. And that's part of the feedback loop. That's part of touching base after the work is done or after the story is told or after the characters, you know, someone goes, oh, I really, I really felt that character. That was really meaningful to me. That, wow, that was powerful. Great. Are your needs met? What else can I do? Would you like to tell others about my story, about my vision, about the way the characters play out? Will you tell others? Because that's a testimonial. And there's a great study by Yelp, who's all known because of everybody's reviews, right? Yelp published this great study saying, look, people believe 80% of 80 of people will make a buying decision based on a review, based on a testimonial, based on somebody else saying something. Even if they've never met that person before, even if it's just an online written thing, 80% of people use that to determine that that is the choice that they also want to make. They are aligning with somebody else who had that problem. They see themselves in that problem and they align with that and say, I want the solution as well. I want to move through that story. I want to move through all of these challenges that I can see in this story because that's part of the resistance, right? That's the challenges that we see to reach that vision outcome and the vision outcome may be for you as the brand owner, but really as just a person who wants that service, I totally resonate and I would tell others. I said it earlier, a brand is really this communication, this relationship that we have with another. Because you can have a business and you can be yourself and you can think that you don't have a brand because you didn't pay somebody to build a logo or to do this strategy work. But the truth is that the way that our brains work is that when somebody thinks of you and the work that you're doing, they form a picture and a feeling that is your brand. So regardless of the size of your company, you have a brand. Regardless of the work that you have put in, working with somebody like myself, a strategist, uh, regardless of what you've done hiring marketers and hiring storytellers or hiring designers or photographers, all of these are just, um, if they're not aligned behind a central vision, if they are not aligned behind your brand strategy, if you don't have a brand strategy, you just have you doing your work, then you are allowing anyone outside of you to control your brand. You are allowing their minds and their projections, right? How they feel about you, how they feel about themselves, how they feel about the service, how they feel about um, pretty much anything 
to override the story because you haven't told them a story. If you don't have brand strategy, you haven't told them a story. You haven't even started using brand influence yet to adjust their view of the world. They need to be educated. They need to be brought into your community. They need to find alignment with who you are and what you're doing. They need to find their path on your story in order to reframe what they know and improve your brand in their vision. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. They are going to continually project and probably share their vision of the world. Now, example of this, it's kind of a funny example, is that uh, my wife and I went to this vegan restaurant uh, at one point, and I'd been there a couple of times, and they were, it's, it's good food. And we went to this vegan restaurant, and my wife ordered, I think it was a curry, and there was a hair in the curry. And she sent it back, and she... <sighs> We laughed at it at the time. We're like, okay, well, let's just let's just get another bowl because it was obviously not her hair. It was just a hair. And and she is weirded out by that. I grew up with dogs, so I'm like, eh, it's a hair and it's a restaurant and it happens sometimes, let it go. And she was just weirded out, so she sent the food back, came back a second time with another hair in it, and we immediately left that restaurant. I, I paid the tab as she just got up, frustrated, sickened, honestly, like really sickened, and she left, and I paid the tab and uh, apologized and, and explained why, and left. Now, in my mind, they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to provide good food. They were trying to provide service. The people were apologetic. The chefs um, were apologetic. I paid the tab because I felt that that was my responsibility to do. In my wife's eyes, they were purposely taunting her. They were messing with her food. Uh, they were They were just they were not being a good business or doing what a good business should do. She felt that we should have had the entire meal comped and that um, it was her right to walk away angry. That anger later on replaced the entire idea of the brand in her eyes and we could never go back because, and she actually told me, you know, don't go back to that place. They are charlatans. They are just messing people over. Um, just don't, don't ever buy there again. That's an example of, you know, this place was just a little hole-in-the-wall vegan restaurant, and th that's an example of how one person's perception from an event in their, in their entire time being a customer can transform their neurobiology of brand, how they feel about your brand, how they feel about anything, by adding in anger, disappointment, fear, ah, frustration, and that happens with a lot of people, particularly because we don't always have time to provide the best service. We are just doing the best we can a lot of the times. Uh huh. We're just doing the best we can. That, that's even in the corporate world. This is what I told people. Look, I'm just doing the best I can. Your boss is doing the best they can. Their boss is doing the best they can. The CEO is just doing the best they can. That's all we're doing. But if you don't have this brand strategy, if you don't have these concepts, if you're not sharing the story, if people in your company don't know your story and what you are doing with this vision, then you're not building the brand right. You're building it so that other people can influence and overtake what that brand should be. So it takes, it takes effort, it takes dedication, and it takes focus. Okay, so those are the five elements of brand influence. Vision, story, character, systems and feedback and what that does all those together create something right it's, it's sort of etheric when we think about it because i haven't even said you know logos are part of system marketing is part of system products are part of system production is part of system but this point of brand influence is creating something that is emotional that moves people that creates movement right systems create movement it creates things that that happen again and again it's it's like setting up a machine that slowly moves down that story to that vision and feedback is the mechanism that makes sure you are in touch with the people at the base of that that are taking all the steps customers or co-workers employees these are all part of the people who need to provide feedback to make sure that the machine that is set up in the systems is moving towards that vision, moving through the story, moving with the right characters toward a goal. So just to wrap up, I want to remind you, if you want this for yourself, if you want 
to work through your story, your vision, your brand strategy, to create the foundation for your brand, whether that's your personal brand, your business, small business, um, consulting, coaching, uh, acupuncture, tire, teaching, um, any of these businesses, any kind of corporation, product, service, idea. If, if you watch the videos in the guides, you know that I'm a huge idea man, and I used my process to show how a simple idea can be developed more. Then go to thinktankcreative.net and click the button right there at the top of the homepage. It is um, for an application to work one-on-one -on -one with me, building all of this for yourself, thinking through big pictures, and creating the brand and the vision that you have of the future and moving towards it because you are worth that and starting something great taking whatever you've got now and building it bigger or taking something big and making it really specific so that it could scale huge that's what business is all about that's what branding is all about this is the fun part and i'm here for you so thank you so much take care